Everett, master of machines. Join us for part two of Ron Klein's incredible Holden collection, where we also had the pleasure of driving his replica of the iconic HDT XU1 V8 prototype. And be sure to subscribe to our channel for more awesome content coming your way. Well, here's one to get the heart racing, Ron. Tell us about this machine. This, Glenn, is a GTR XU2, although there's a lot of debate about whether they were actually going to be called XU2s. But I need to point out this is a replica. This is definitely not the genuine article. Uh, it's a GTR XU2 replica. It's got a 308 V8 in it, uh, as the original prototypes did that were built by Harry Firth. This one's been stroked to 355, so it produces a little bit of extra horsepower. It's about 231 kilowatts at the rear wheels. Um, it's a car that I bought by, from a gentleman called Rory up in Queensland who built the car many, many years ago and it was the first car that I bought when I decided it was time to have a go at doing some track days. So I bought this car specifically for that. Um, I have spent some serious money on this car and I think anybody who owns a track car and plays with them as I do who can't do the mechanics themselves and the body themselves does end up spending serious money on these things. Um, it's cost me a penny. Uh, it's taken a long time to get reliable. Hang I've on, your a... wife's watching. She's going to be watching this. Yes, well, perhaps we might just have to suggest we edit, to her Should we edit that out? We should probably edit that out a little bit. Um, well, it wasn't that much. It was... no. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, so the car is, uh, is now pretty reliable. It's got a nine-inch diff in it and a top loader, which is inconsistent with the original car. I know that but I got sick of breaking banjo diffs and M21 gearboxes. They were popping the whole time and it just became ridiculous. So what I've done is I've built this thing for reliability. You'll also probably notice, or those viewers who are familiar with this car might notice that it hasn't got the original 13 inch wheels on it anymore. That's because one of the challenges that you have with a car like this is that when you put a great big thumping V8 in it and you can produce 231 kilowatts at the rear wheels, um, that's a hell of a lot better than it stops and it was actually a dangerous car to drive. So we've upgraded the brakes to make it stop a little bit better and make it safer to run. And today it's a, a lovely track car. It's, the engine was rebuilt about five or six years ago and it's still going strong today. It sounds absolutely awesome. It's just got the best rumble as a stroker tends to have. You know, the strokers tend to make that very deep note. Fun to drive, four speed. Um, racing around Sandown or Phillip Island as I regularly do in this car. It's a whole lot of fun. It's great. You're talking around 400 horsepower at the flywheel. In a lightweight car, it's probably all of 1,100 kilograms. What a missile. What a missile. It, it, it is quick. Um, the, uh, I often say the only thing that holds this car back from breaking lap records is the idiot behind the wheel. Because, uh, <laughs> That's a bit harsh, Whereas mate. they say the nut, be, the nut behind, behind the, the wheel, wheel. <laughs> because I I'm, I'm, don't profess to be a racing car driver. But again, my objective when I take this thing out is to have fun, not to go fast. It's a lovely car. It's lots of fun. And gee, it draws a lot of attention as well for a prototype. It's incredible how many people are aware of the GDR XU2 and what it meant to Holden and, and why it didn't proceed with the, the muscle car scare and all the things that happened way back then in the early 70s. So Ron, tell me, where did your passion start for cars? It's just something that I've had ever since I can remember. I don't have a childhood memory of not being crazy about cars and I guess where it really became silly was in 1972 I remember the GDR XU1 was launched and it was just the most amazing motor car to me. I just adored it, loved it, wanted one, always did. Um, sadly, it took me 35 years to get one, but eventually I did and uh, that's when the passion really started. And you're obviously pretty keen on the Holden product. I know you have other cars. Most people inherit what their dad was and my dad was a Holden man. He always was through and through and I inherited that from him way back to when I fell in love with the GDR XU1 in 1972. So yes, I am a Holden person but that doesn't mean I have a closed mind to other brands of cars and I've got some other cars that I love equally as I love Holdens. But yeah, Holdens have got the real soft spot for me. Ron, a giant killer. Tell us about this little LJ mate. Glenn, this was the, uh, the beginning of the love affair for me, as I might have mentioned before, when I was uh, back in 1972 and I saw these first come onto the road, I just thought they were the most magnificent thing I'd ever seen and I vowed then that I was going to own one. As I said, it took me 35 years to get to that point, but eventually I did. 
So this was the first, this was the beginning of the collection, the first car that I bought. I bought it from here in Melbourne. It was in bad need of restoration once again and, uh, and brought it home and it was a labour of love. I, I'm not mechanically minded, particularly myself, and I'm not a panel beater or anything. So as a consequence, I had to get it all done and it took a long time and cost a lot of money, but I finished up with this beautiful um, 1972 LJ GDR XU1. It's the six cylinder one in the collection. Uh, the sound is just fantastic. Lovely to drive. So light and easy and nimble to drive. It's a lovely machine. Salamanca Red's a great colour. Um, the houndstooth trim really sets it off. Um, David Jones pattern, as so many people <laughs> frequently refer to it. Um, and that's held up pretty well also. It's a, it's a lovely combination. A nice car. And they were a giant killer. I mean, Peter Brock took on the mighty GTHO with Alan Moffat at the wheel and a damp Bathurst and won, didn't he? And people would have said a little six cylinder like this wasn't going to do it, but I think they left him for dead in the straights, but he caught them up in the corners and that's what they're all about. They're just a really quick, nippy little car. The steering on it is remarkable. It's got such, it hasn't got power steering, obviously. It's way before power steering was introduced onto cars, but the steering, you can turn it with your finger. It's just so light. It's, uh, it's a fabulous little car and a joy to drive, good fun. Turns heads too, when you're driving it on the street, you pull up at the traffic lights. I've had people literally jump in front of me as I've been sitting at traffic lights with their phones and their cameras taking pictures of the car saying, please don't drive off till I've got a photo of it. And the other thing that I find really interesting about this car is that, you know, even among my own kids, there are people who are half the age of this vehicle who know all about a GDR XU1 Tirana and who love it and appreciate it for what it is. And, you know, it's, it, I find that quite fascinating that a car that, that, that is 20 years older than a person, that person can still appreciate it and love it and think it's great. It just shows you how iconic these things are. And the legend of the big three at Bathurst and the carts, it's absolutely amazing, isn't it? And people keep saying to me, Glenn, they ain't making any more of them, and that's absolutely the case. You know, it's a, it's a piece of motoring history, and, and hopefully this one's going to be around for a lot longer yet, and I'm going to get a lot more enjoyment out of it. Ron actually said I can drive this XU2 replica. That's right, a replica of the car Harry Firth built. You ready? Join me. Enjoy the ride. Wow, <laughs> can't believe it. I'm driving the XU2 replica, just like the one that Harry Firth was behind, a prototype car. Sure, there's some modern upgrades on this vehicle to make it a bit tougher, but it's very, very close to like the real car would have been back in the day. Unbelievable. In fact, they say that it wasn't necessarily gonna be called the XU2. That was actually the prefix used for the new and up-and-coming LH Tirana. Supposedly going to be called the XU1 GTR V8. You know what? Who cares? It was going to be a V8. Whatever name. Awesome! What a weapon this thing is. I can't believe how sedate it is. It's got a fair-sized camshaft in it. But being a stroker with a few extra cubic inches, it certainly helps drivability. Pretty special moment this driving this car. Something I never thought I'd be doing. I know it's not the real one, but it's the closest thing I'm gonna ever get to driving that car. It looks like it, it sounds like it, and it goes like it. It all relates back to that muscle car scare or the supercar scare as they call it back in the early 70s. When the government chopped all of these missiles that were being built for people to buy off the street, death traps they called them. Look, in some hands they may have been, but I'm sure most of the owners would have looked after them. They were being built for motor racing. They were being built for one purpose, and that was to go out and win at Bathurst. She's a torque monster, an absolute torque monster. I reckon the biggest problem would be traction. Keeping that power to the ground, that's one area where they would have struggled. 
Sure, it's got a big heavy V8 over the front with the Holden V8, which might have created handling issues back in the day, but from what I'm told, Harry Firth said these things handled absolutely fantastic in this configuration. And the powder weight would have been astronomical. It would have been a missile down Conrod Strait. I've heard reports that back in the day, these cars, or this particular car, was going to be a 160 mile per hour car. That is so damn fast. There's something else I heard. In a bit of testing in those early days with Larry Perkins behind the wheels, they saw an indicated 170 mile per hour. And I tell you what, after feeling the acceleration in this car, I wouldn't doubt it. Obviously the best place for this car is the racetrack. We can't take advantage of all the power on the road. I tell you what though, if I could get on the racetrack with this thing and unleash it, I reckon it'd be an experience beyond belief. Even driving it now at a normal pace is outstanding. It's exhilarating and it's getting my heart racing. Have a listen to this thing. It's not even trying. Not even revving the thing up. That's about three and a half thousand to four thousand RPM. Thing's off tap. <laughs> couldn't unleash it on the street. Be very irresponsible of me. Requires a lot of discipline and control. This thing is a raw beast. It's raw, it's loud, it's angry, it's cammed up, it's clunky. Everything you love about a track car, a muscle car from this era. You know you're driving them, you know you're alive. Not like a modern day vehicle where there's no wind noise and they're silky smooth, they handle like they're on rails. These things are a driver's car. You've got to grab them by the scruff of the neck and you've got to control them. Just like they would have in the day around Bathurst. It's such a damn shame that that supercar scare happened. If something like Brock behind the wheel of something like this, no one would have caught him. The E55 Charger and the Phase 4 GT would have given them a run for their money, but gee so hard to beat a lightweight car with a big V8 engine. And that's why. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, baby! <laughs> I want this car. I want every car. That's my problem. <laughs> I'm a lucky man. <laughs>